Hello, everyone. My name is Gila Fakori. I am the president of the Amr Foundation, an organization that advocates for victims of illegal detention and supports democracy in the Middle East. I stand before you not as an, just as an advocate, but as someone who has experienced the devastating impact of illegal detention firsthand. My father, Amr Fakori, who was a US citizen and a resident of New Hampshire, fell victim to illegal detention in Lebanon and died due to the torture he faced in captivity. Today we gather in New Hampshire, a significant state that is the home base of four organizations that have been united by a common cause to shed light on the plight of political hostages and victims of illegal detention. The Amr Foundation is joined by the James Foley Legacy Foundation, an organization built in honor of James Foley, also a New Hampshire resident, and a journalist who tragically lost his life to ISIS captivity. We are also joined by the Landis Foundation, a group dedicated to advocating for human rights and justice worldwide, honoring the legacy of Congressman Tom Landis. And we are joined by the World Affair Council of New Hampshire, an organization that aims to engage the public in international issues and relations. This event is not just a gathering of like-minded individuals. It's a testament to our collective determination to seek justice and uphold human rights. Today, as we gather under the banner of Heroes Amongst Us, we share the story of one individual who embodies the struggle against illegal detention. Paul Resasabagina, known for his heroic action during the Rwandan genocide, Paul faced a different form of injustice when unlawfully detained in Rwanda. Paul's story is a powerful reminder of the grave consequences of political persecution and the urgent need for justice. The schedule of today's event can be found on the program sheets. We also have a QR code on there for anyone that would like to donate. All donations will be split evenly among the four organizations. We encourage anyone who can to donate and to support the organization's missions. I want to thank everyone who made this event possible today. I want to personally thank the Bank of New Hampshire for donating to this event. I would also like to personally thank Neil Levesque and the Institute of Politics of New Hampshire for allowing us to host this event here. And thank you to everyone here tonight for joining this powerful event. We hope you leave inspired and motivated to help us in this fight against injustice. Together, we can make a difference and build a future where the heroes among us are honored, not imprisoned. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Katrine Sweat Lentes and Paul Reses Regina for the fireside chat. Thank you. What a thrill it is to be here today with all of you. Um, I also want to thank Neil Levesque and uh, we're just grateful for this opportunity to be in this distinguished venue that has welcomed so many incredibly significant figures in the public life of our nation. But I would venture to say rarely have we welcomed someone with as heroic of a story as the man I'm going to have the privilege of talking with today. I'm going to read you some brief excerpts from letters we received from our wonderful congressional delegation, from Senator Jean Shaheen and from Congressman Chris Pappas. So I'd like to, to share those words. They very much wanted to be with us today um, and were not able to, so they sent a message instead. From Senator Shaheen, she writes, I join you in spirit at this evening's presentation. Thank you to the partners for coming together to organize this powerful program, and thank you to our featured speakers for lending your thoughts and sharing your heart-wrenching personal experiences in this meaningful conversation. Having played a role in numerous hostage cases, I know the agony and the anguish that families experience as they face the unimaginable pain and uncertainty of being separated from their loved ones. Please know that I remain firmly committed to working with advocates, journalists, government officials, and experts to help sharpen US policy and actions to ensure the safe return of all Americans and put an end 
to the use of Americans as political tools of our adversaries. And from Congressman Pappas, he says, thank you to the four outstanding nonprofits, I agree, the non out four outstanding nonprofit organizations for hosting tonight's event. I am sorry I'm unable to attend, but know that I am deeply grateful for the invitation. A special thank you goes to the humanitarian hero, Paul Rusesa Bagina, for sharing his remarkable story. Mr. Rusesa Bagina's extraordinary efforts to save hundreds of Rwandans and provide them shelter in his hotel demonstrates the utmost levels of humanity, bravery, and service. Despite his recent unjust imprisonment, Mr. Rusesa Bagina persevered and continues to work to make the world a better place. While we can never fully repay our debt of gratitude to Mr. Rusesa Bagina, we are forever thankful for his selfless service. To those here today, I hope Mr. Rusesa Bagina's story serves as an inspiration as you continue to fight injustices and advocate for basic human rights. So we're, we're thankful to um, the members of our congressional delegation for their support of this event. Well, you are in the midst of a real hero. Last night, I happened to watch a beautiful film that I recommend to all of you called One Life, which tells the story of Nicholas Winton, a British stockbroker who was responsible for arranging the so-called kinder transports to rescue 669 largely Jewish children from Czechoslovakia after the Nazi invasion of that country. And I thought how appropriate that today I would be with a man who rescued twice that number in the midst of a truly unimaginable genocide, brutal and primitive and at a level of violence that few of us can imagine. And so, Paul, my first question to you today, because it's on all of our minds, where does someone find the courage in the face of horror to stand up with such humanity? I think that is in something you will go and buy in a market. That is you, the person you are. That is you who stand in the middle and say no when you have got to say no. No to each and everyone who does wrong. So I stood in the middle for just justice. When I was a young, my young person, I'm going to tell you a story of my father. All of us, his children, wherever we would be in the country, we would always go home for the New Year's Eve. Each and everyone was there, or was supposed to be there, on December 31st. And that day, our dad would slaughter a beef for us. It was a celebration. We would enjoy, eat and drink. But at the end of each and every event, which we did every year. At the end, our father would always give us a lesson. One of the lessons he gave us was that, listen, my children, if you happen to see two brothers fighting and you are called upon to come and separate those brothers, come and stand here in the middle. Do never make a mistake of looking to your right hand side because that brother who is on your right hand side is trying to corrupt your decision. And do never make a mistake of looking to your left 
Because that brother also who is on your left hand side is trying to corrupt your decision. Dad will tell us that you, my children, stand in the middle and look up. Look up and say the truth and only the truth. That is the only way to solve any conflict. So in 1994, I was not going to stand on the Hutu side. I was not going to stand on the Tutsi side because Hutus and Tutsis were fighting. But to me, those who are fighting are fighting. They know why they are fighting. But there is no good reason to kill somebody who is not fighting against you. So I stood in the middle and said no, whatever I had to say no. And anyway, I have come to believe in one thing, and this is what I would tell all those who were torturing me when I was kidnapped. I just believe that one day I will die. For that, I'm 100, I can even say 150% sure. <laughs> the only thing I do not know is when. Who is doing it? How is he or she going to do it? Where? Those are the things I do not know. But dying, I know. But I'm also 100% sure that I will never, ever die one, one day, one hour, one minute before the time determined by the Almighty. That is why I stood in the middle and said, at the, at the end I was looking at myself, I would say, ah, is it me? Am I really alive? Not dead? But I was still there. <laughs> well, I, I understand some of that courage came from a father who taught you well and wisely. Some of it came from your faith and your belief that you have a destiny and what a destiny you've had. But I would say, Paul, you didn't only stand in the middle. You interposed yourself between the innocent and the murderers. So you were in the middle saying the truth and doing what was right. But I want to ask another question because you, you've always been very modest and you in fact titled I think your memoir An Ordinary Man, although I would beg to differ. But you know, most of us haven't had Don Cheadle play us in a major Hollywood <laughs> film. Most of us haven't gotten the Presidential Medal of Honor, the highest civilian honor in this country. I felt incredibly honored that the Lantos Foundation was able to give you our prize, and there have been many, many other honors. But in the initial period of time after um, the genocide, you were also honored and recognized in your own country. But at a certain point, Paul Kagame turned against you. Can you tell us what led to the president of Rwanda turning against in a way, Rwanda's most famous and most admired native son. Well, you know, the very time you stand and tell the truth, the truth hurts. As I said previously, the Rwandan genocide is something that took place in a specific time. 1994. Kagame is a Tutsi who is one among those ones who invaded Rwanda in 1990, October 1st. Since they invaded Rwanda that day, they started killing civilians. As they were fighting, Millions of Rwandans were fleeing all the zones they occupied. They were then, even after 
the three months of the, of the genocide, which the United States has openly said that it is not a Tutsi genocide, it is a, Rwanda, a Rwandan genocide. Because all Rwandans died during the war. However, the winner, who happened to be today's Rwandan president, who has been there for 30 years, that winner won the war and is trying to write history his own way. So if you stand and say that that man is lying, then you are a dead person. For Kagame, either you are with him, working for him, or you are dead. You do not need to be a Hutu or Tutsi to, for him to kill. He kills Hutus as he kills Tutsis. So me, when I had an opportunity, whenever I had an opportunity to speak up, to tell the world about what was going on, what the Rwandan government was doing, inviting people for meetings, just as if you see we are here, maybe 150, 200 people. So he would invite people for meetings and kill all of them after the period of the genocide. So somebody had to tell that. And I am that somebody who stood up and said, no, this is not what we fought for. This is not what we are looking for. This is no reconciliation. So the very day you say what he doesn't want to be said, you are an enemy. Either you are for him, doing everything for him, you are on his side, or a dead person. So I had, at a given time, I had to go to exile. That is how I went to Belgium in 1996, September 6, two years later after the period which is called the period of the genocide. That is how I went to exile. Even in Belgium, they followed me. My home was ransacked four times in Brussels. I once had a very suspicious accident. So they have been trying to have my head cut off many times, but so far, I believe that I will never die before that day, before that hour, before that minute determined by God the Almighty. You know, uh, I'll just suggest I'm making movie and book recommendations for you tonight, but there is a fascinating book written by a British journalist, Michaela Wrong called Do Not Disturb. And for any of you who would be interested in learning about sort of the history, the much mm -hmm. more complex history um, than that which we are familiar with just from reading the headlines about Rwanda, I, I strongly <laughs> recommend it. So you've let us know that because you were telling some very, very uncomfortable truths, you had to go into exile. And you never intended to return to Rwanda because you knew that to do so could be the end. But you were kidnapped and taken there against your will. In those first days, before even your family knew where you were, we just knew you had disappeared, um, what, what were some of the thoughts that went through your head? And I know you have this faith that you know, the time of your life is appointed, but, but did you think at that time that maybe that, that moment has come? Well, first of all, maybe I can tell you how I was kidnapped. The man who kidnapped me called himself the man of God. He came to kidnap me in the name of God. He called himself apostle, bishop, pastor, and whatever we want. He called himself 
Aburundese, not Rwandese. So he told me that he had churches. And he said, he invited, he, he, he told me, he came to me and told me that, listen, Paul, I mean, he was introduced to me, first of all, by a Rwandan lawyer who lives in Brussels, who told me that he was his lawyer. So he came to me and told me that, listen, Paul, we know you talk about justice. You talk about the truth. You talk about reconciliation. You are the right person to kind of talk to my people, the Burundese people. And yet he was a Rwandese. Maybe you do not know that in Rwanda and Burundi, Rwandese and Burundese, we do speak a same language. We say that Burundese speak it with accent. Maybe that is also what they say. <laughs> so, so that man invited, now invited me to his churches. And he told me that, don't worry. We are even going to pay you. We have whatever you want, but we need your lessons in Burundi. So I was not going to Rwanda. I was invited to come to, come to Burundi. So then, I said, okay, now I can travel, I can travel and come to Burundi. But what if I happen to be flying and the flight I might take might land in Kampala, Uganda, in Nairobi, Kenya, or Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, or anywhere else, but go through Kigali to Bujumbura, then I will be a dead person. He said, don't worry. Our problem is not money. We are going to hire a private jet and take you, we are taking you to Burundi, not to Rwanda. We are hiring a private jet, but as you see, we are not going to hire a private jet from the United States. It is too far, but we can hire it from another destination from um, Dubai, from um, any other country which is not close to Rwanda. I said, okay, for that, I can come to Burundi. So we organized. I was going to Burundi. Took a, I took a flight from San Antonio to Chicago, Chicago to Dubai. When I landed at Dubai airport, I called my wife and told her, that, listen, I'm now landed. No, I've just landed. Now I'm going to Bujumbura. As, as soon as we land at Bujumbura Airport, I will call you and let you know where we are. So I just, I just crossed the immigration and met the bishop, who actually, first of all, wanted to send me a private jet but him not to be there. So I said, no, 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 then I'm not coming because I cannot trust anyone. He said, okay, I'll be there. So he was waiting for me in Dubai at the immigration. So I crossed, we met him, we greeted, talked, and then he told me, okay, now let us go to the plane, the private jet. As we were walking, we met a man. He told me that this guy is um, a pilot of that company, that private jet. And then he told me, introduced him to me, told me that, listen, here is our pilot. And I, then I just greeted the pilot, and I told him that, sir, you are the one who is going to take us to our destination. What is your name? Where are we heading to? He told me, my name is Alexander. We are going to Bujumbura. Meaning to say that the private company, the, the company, the, the, the private jet company also knew what was going on. So 
we went up to the plane. There was a lady. Then they introduced her and told me she's the hostess. I said, okay, is she the hostess? If she's the hostess then, madam, what is, where are we heading to? What is your name? She told me, I'm Alice, and we are going to Bujumbura. So everybody knew what kind of game they were playing. It was an elaborate scheme, a yes. very elaborate scheme. Then they took me, no, I just got into the plane. I trusted everybody. Got into the plane, and I was given a glass of champagne in the plane, and immediately I just slept, which is very, very rare. I can travel in the same flight for 12, 15 hours without sleeping. By that time, I immediately slept. And when I just happened to kind of get up, woke up, I woke up when the, the, the plane just landed on the ground. And I saw the former the tower, the tower of control of the airport of Kigali. I saw myself in Rwanda. I almost collapsed, but said to myself that it is never the end until the end. Maybe this is not the end, but I'm, it is almost finished. And I immediately saw some soldiers who were moving around, including some of them who looked like um, the Arabs and people like that. So I just shut up, didn't want to say anything. Then I just, we, when we kind of stopped, they opened the door of the plane, I immediately stood at the door and shouted loudly, calling for help, saying that me, Paul I'm kidnapped, I'm kidnapped, I'm taken back to Rwanda, they are going to kill me. They are going to kill me, me, Paul Sesabagina, saying it many times. And immediately, the Rwanda Investigation Bureau people, the, what are the, the military, the, 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 the military directorate of intelligence, all of those guys just came running. And they took me, they took me on the ground got my hands, my arms tied from the back, legs tied, my head in a pocket, and they put it in a bag, and then closed. I was almost dead, finished. At a given time when, when I could not kind of um, just breathe, I would just do some, some signs, telling the people that I'm almost dead they would just relax a little bit. They took me to an unknown place, which they call the safe houses. That is where they kill all of those people they do not want. I was taken there and immediately beaten. They started torturing me. I was tortured, hitting my head, hitting my back, my whole body. I was, my, they had a military boots on my neck, on my legs, tied, everything. I was almost dead. I stayed there being tortured for almost four days because I landed in the night of August 27th 2020, and I was shown to the international, the whole world on August 31st at one, it was one, but in me I could not see anything, 1 p.m., I could not see anything from the very day they took me there to the very day I got out. But in the meantime, there in the safe houses, what do they do? They torture people. That is where they torture people. That is where you hear some people maying, crying, making noise, calling for help. 
saying that they are going to be killed, they are being killed, they are being killed. You hear a voice, just after one hour, two hours, three hours, the voice, just next door, the voice disappears, and you say, you say to yourself that who is next? It is maybe me. Uh, thank, thank you for being willing to share that. I had never had the chance to hear from you what had happened in those horrible hours. Now, as you know, there were a lot of individuals, a legal team, Don Cheadle, human rights activists, the Lantos Foundation was honored to be part of the teams working, pleading, lobbying tirelessly for your release. I have sort of two questions. One is, to what extent were you aware that there was this movement outside the prison, outside those terrible walls you were imprisoned behind, that was working for your freedom, and, and how much of a difference do you think it made? And, and if prisoners being unlawfully and unjustly held do know that they aren't forgotten, do know that not only their family, but those beyond their family are fighting for them, does that help their mental strength, their ability mentally to survive? Well, in my in my life, one of my principles is very simple. Do never give up. Whatever you do, do it up to the end. So I kept saying no when I had to say no. I kept refusing a lot of things. You even saw me leaving the court, saying that I'm pulling out because I'm not satisfied. I would talk to my family. I was only allowed to call one person when I had that chance after months. I could call, I was allowed to call my wife. But since she was not close to them, she could connect the whole family. And I could talk to the whole family. It was five minutes, nothing more. I'm paying my own money. I'm talking to my wife, but I'm not allowed to talk to her for at least 10, 20 minutes just five minutes every Friday. So they could not, they were not allowed, that they could not tell me what they were supposed to be telling me, what was going on outside there. Mm. I was not told about what was going on outside. I was not allowed to talk about politics. I was not allowed to talk about what I was going through. Just hello, how are you? How is how are the children? Thank you. Bye. But they would tell me in a kind of proverbs. Tell me that it's just a word and I would hear. I would understand. Because there is a kind of language you talk when you have been living together, when you are husband and wife, the children and parents. They, there is always a kind of discretion, discreet way of talking. So they would talk to me in that kind of way when we started talking. But it was not, it was not that easy. It was not simple. It was really complicated. But still, whatever I do, we've got to do it. Even if we say no, let us say no. Well, I, I love that image of you talking to Tasi, who we're so honored to have here today, too, in that special language that a family has where you can say things that others won't understand, but 
but the two of you do. You know, Paul, after the life you've lived, after the sacrifices you've made, and after the ordeal you've just come through, I think everybody would understand if you said, I've done enough. I want to now live a quiet and a private life. I want to withdraw from engagement in the public eye. And yet, here you are today. Just the other day, you had a powerful, powerful editorial in the New York Times. Why, why do you continue to engage? I know you said one of your mottos is to never give up till the end. And in that regard, why do you continue to fight the good fight? And what is your dream or your hope for your beloved Rwanda? There are many reasons why I still do have to fight. One of those reasons is that Rwanda, a small country, which is more or less the size of Vermont in the United States, with the 1994, we were 7 million. At least a million people were killed. Three or four fled the country. Today we do not know the real population of Rwanda. But that small country has got 19 prisons. And in the prison when I was, we were 18,500 prisoners. 16,000 men and 2,500 women in just in one prison, one of 19, we were 18,500. You can imagine how many people are in prison in that country. When I was in prison for the two years and seven months, I was, I was not allowed to talk to any prisoner. For the first almost 10 months, between, the, between August 27th and July no, 2020 and July 12th, 2021, 2021, that is almost 10, almost 10 months, I was going out just one hour a day in a solitary confinement that is where I was. They tried actually to kind of kill me psychologically. That was the aim. But I believe it couldn't work psychologically. So I, could, I was not able to talk to anyone but prisoners and whenever I would go out during that period, all the prisoners were just, just brought inside because nobody was living on my block. It, in my block. My block was just mine, no one else, which was also a torture. According to Mandela rule, even if you are in such a solitary confinement for 15 days, you are psychologically being tortured. But me, I was there for almost 10 months. And I would go out only one hour a day, taken out by the military, you know, the, the directorate of intelligence, which had seven soldiers, intelligence guys, who, were, who would be following me, even when I was calling my family, two of them, one would stand on my left hand side and the other one would stand on my right hand side so that they hear what my wife is telling me. So, that, so, so what, in that prison, even if I was tortured, I could not, I did not, know what, the prisoners were looking at me, they knew who I was. The very time I was, I was supposed to be free, 
the radio said that the government met, had a meeting, and decided to free me. So I expected to be free that day. When it was on Friday, March 24th, 2023, about a year ago, I celebrated my first anniversary on last night, on a few, a few weeks ago, almost three weeks ago. So then my wife, now, my wife tried to tell me, to ask me whether they told me, I said, no, what? no, no, you are supposed to be free, and, but you know, in the, just in, in a different language. And I said, no, I then, I, I then waited to be free that day. When I waited to be free, I could, they could not set me free a daytime. Why? Because they were a friend of journalists. There were many journalists who were outside the prison waiting for me so that they can interview me and tell the world or, or just write whatever they wanted to, uh, to, to write. And they didn't want anybody to talk to me. So I waited. We, sp we spoke at three, and I waited at four, nobody, nothing happened. At five, nothing happened. Six, nothing happened. Seven, eight. At a given time, I went to my small bed, sat down, and was thinking about what would be next. When I was just desperate, I heard the kind of padlock or the prison, or the block in which I was heating. I was on the first floor, and all of those doors are metal doors with big, huge padlocks. So when they opened it, it just happened to hit the metal, and I heard it. When I heard it, I said, what is going on, what is going on now? Now, they, just, they, they came to my floor, the first floor where I was. I heard once again another padlock. Also, heating. I said to myself, but what is going wrong now? <laughs> when I was asking myself what was going wrong, I saw the director of the prison, his, his assistant, the assistant director, the many high-ranking military guys, including generals, just getting into the room where I was. To myself, somebody who had been kidnapped, that was maybe another, another way of killing me, getting me out and killing me. So they, the director told me that you get up. I said, I get up. Get up, I say. Get up and go where? Get up, you are free. You are supposed to get to get up. I said, oh, I am so sorry, sir. In our tradition, whenever a man is home in the night and they have locked the house, that man from my great-grandfather to my grandfather, my father, and myself, we respect that tradition. So I'm sorry, I'm not getting out. <laughs> he said, you get out. I said, did you hear what I said? He immediately called the high commissioner of the prisons and told him that that guy refused to go out. Then the other one said, oh, let me talk to him. He said, you get up, you are free, you are not supposed to spend this night in prison. I told him, uh, did your guy here tell you our tradition? <laughs> uh, he might have told you or not, but I believe that a message is correct, goes the right way when I tell 
when I say it myself in my own word, I repeated our family tradition. And I said, therefore, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I'm not getting out tonight. Then I'll be getting out tomorrow. He said, no, there are also some diplomats who are waiting for you here. I said, uh, please tell them on my behalf. Thank them and tell them that I'll, I'll see them tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Paul, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm going to have to stop you because you are the best storyteller. You have taken so, us inside that prison in those so, unbelievable circumstances. And let me now put on a conclusion on this. Then, then, then he, went, he just put it off, put the phone off. And um, about 30 minutes later, he called again, called the director of the prison who didn't leave, and uh, the generals, and um, all of um, his um, uh, assistants, many people. And then uh, to, to say, I want to talk to that guy. And then the director of prison gave me the phone. He said, uh, he passed me the U.S. ambassador, and um, she, she talked to me and told me that, listen, now we have come to free you. And um, I am with um, Dan, who had been uh, the, the, the consul, a guy, the guy from the consulate who was visiting me every, uh, uh, he, was, he was visiting me every month. So he's, he was laughing, very happy, telling me that, now we have come to free you. I said, okay. That is a very good news. Now I can break my family's rules and regulations <laughs> and, uh, and get out. <laughs> but then, when the director of the prison and all of those generals and um, his assistants, when they were getting into the prison, prisoners saw them coming in. They expected me to get out. They couldn't see me. So that when they saw the director coming there, they said, now he's going to be free. Let us line up from the block where I was to the exit of the prison, which is the prison is just a city. 18,000 people, you can imagine. So now they were lined up and they were waiting for me. And then they gave me, they were seeing when they saw me getting out. And those um, army guys are the ones who were carrying my bags and everything. So when the, they saw me getting out, the prisoners started singing very loudly, very high, saying that, listen, Mr. Sesabagina, and this is the message I want the answer. Listen, Mr. Sesabagina, you have been the speak, our, the, our voice for so many years. You have been the voice for the voicelesses. Now you have now seen, come to this prison. You have seen how we are being tortured. You have seen what has been going on. Now, please, now that you are once again going out, please be our voice. Tell the world about what you have seen and what is going on, not only in this prison, but also in this country. So my mission is very clear. When I was leaving the prison, prisoners gave me a mission, and I have to respect that mission, this is why I will never give up, I will never shut up. And also, I, I hate one thing, I hate the war, but I love to fight whenever necessary. And the best and, and, the best and worst weapon in life is not a missile, it is not a gun, it is nothing like that, it is words. With the words, you can do whatever you want, and you'll always win whatever happens. Thank you. Join me in thanking Paul Rusesa Bagina. This has been incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Paul you. and I are going to take our seats, and we have an extraordinary panel that will now give us further insight into how we fight for the release of the unjustly imprisoned, um, and then we'll return later oops, to take some of your questions. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, while we transition here, how about another round of applause for Paul and Katrina and their wonderful conversation.
While we uh, do this little transition here, let me get out of the way. Um, my name is Tim Horgan. I am the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. I am equally as excited to hear from our distinguished panel here with us today. Beth and Zoya and Diane, if you all want to grab a seat. Yeah, Diane, if you're, you're right there in the middle. Um, so we're really excited. Uh, we're going to try and keep this nice and tight. Um, so we'll, we'll cut down on introductions uh, to, uh, to, to the main points. And you can always find out more about the backgrounds of these wonderful people uh, online and through our various websites of the different organizations. So um, the important parts being, and I want to get Beth's title right because it's a long one, and I always like to make sure that I get them right. She was the former uh, Senior Advisor to the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, she's been involved in uh, detainee recoveries and related services from Russia, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, West Africa, West Africa Yemen, and Rwanda itself, but was not directly involved with, with Paul's uh, case. So um, why don't we start there, Beth, and you give us a little bit of your insights, and then I'll uh, move to our other panelists and, and do some introductions for them as well. Are, are you on? I think so. Can you hear me? Wonderful. It's great to be here. Thank you first to the Lantos Foundation, to the uh, World Affairs Council of New Hampshire, the Foley Foundation, the Amir Foundation, New Hampshire Institute of Politics, and have I named everybody? Great job. <laughs> thank you. And thanks to everybody here tonight um, at St. Anselm's College and all of those tuning in to watch this and learn about these important issues. Um, I was at the Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs at the State Department, as Tim said, and I was also at the Hostage Recovery Fusion Cell, which is located at the FBI headquarters. Uh, those are two of the prongs of the three-prong U.S. government hostage recovery enterprise, the third being over at the White House. I am going to speak very briefly. You can see I had a lot to say, but I'm going to cut it down to just some really top line things. First of all, I'm really thrilled to be here to talk about this from the U.S. government perspective. Um, but the U.S. government is not the only ones who work on these cases. It's, it's a team effort. And the hostage recovery enterprise really is made up of government, families, former detainees, hostages, foundations, advocacy organizations, corporations, academia, um, the legal community, and really so many more. So our, our topic tonight is really about partnerships and how they work with the U.S. government to, to get some people home. During these remarks, I want to stress four things. First, one of the main missions of the hostage recovery enterprise is to bring people home. Secondly, family support is critical. Third, prevention and deterrence are key. And fourth, the civil society partnerships are very, very necessary. Um, I'm not going to go into definitions. I'm not going to try and teach you anything tonight. And maybe we will get into that more in the Q&A. But just to show a hands, how many of you know what a wrongful detention is? OK, and a hostage. Right. Um, hostage, U.S. citizen, taken by um, a non-state actor, non-government actor. Think terrorist organizations, think ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Taliban. Wrongful detention is when a U.S. national is detained by a foreign government, state actor. Um, these are typically cases for, of uh, humans being used as bargaining chips, political pawns for leverage, countries that are detaining. They're not our friendly countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. They are our adversaries. Think Iran, think Russia, think China, think Venezuela. Um, these cases are abhorrent. They violate international law and human rights. They undermine trust in nations, and they're really a security um, threat to the traveling public. I want to stress that there, um, the U.S. government has, no, has such a sense of urgency in resolving these cases and freeing Americans who are held 
detained or hostage abroad. It might not seem like that to families sometimes who really understandably want their loved ones home immediately, but every day U.S. government officials and all different agencies are working on these cases behind the scenes. They are strategizing together, they're negotiating with foreign countries, they're coordinating on recoveries, they are sharing information with the public, all with the goal of bringing people home. Um, every case is different, they have unique solutions, there's no cookie cutter approach to these cases, and they take a lot of time. There have been a lot of successes over the past few years. Um, during the Biden administration, 46 Americans were brought home. I also want to stress that um, family support is key. It's equally as important as, important as bringing people home, and the U.S. government is working on that every single day. Um, Ambassador Karstens, who is the current special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, every time there's a new case, he will fly out to that family's home and sit down and talk with them and explain to them what's going to happen, who the people in the government are that you're going to be dealing with, wants to share information, learn from the families, because the, it's the belief that partnering with the families really is important for bringing people home. But the NGOs are very critical in this space. NGOs like the Foley Foundation, the Amer Foundation, Lantos Foundation, um, others, Hostage US, Bring Our Families Home, Hostage Aid Worldwide, they support and advocate on behalf of families. But they also hold government accountable. They ensure that the government is, is acting transparently, is laser focused and prioritizing these cases. They lobby Congress to fix these cases, fix solutions, uh, change laws, and they are really an indispensable part of the process. Preventing and taking, um, preventing these takings and deterring this behavior is key. It's something that the government is working really hard on. Pre for prevention, awareness is key. And there's a lot of travel warnings out there, a lot of travel information. The U.S. government has an amazing website. The problem is, is it getting to the traveling public? Um, I know there's a lot of students out here. I think under 25-year-olds are not going to the U.S. government websites to get their information. So this information needs to be on social media, on TikTok, on uh, Facebook, all, any Twitter where most people get their information nowadays. Public service announcements, um, celebrities, influencers really need to be talking about the risks of travel to certain countries. And deterring this behavior is critical. I could go on for hours because it's something really important to me. I think deterring this behavior is really what's gonna shut down the offices I used to work in. That is the goal, right? Um, so instead of just the standard go-to sanctions, they're looking at tools, multilateral tools, domestic tools, that will really hurt countries. It will raise the cost of doing this kind of business, so it will end. This is not a U.S. problem, it's a global problem. 75 countries came together um, behind the Canadian-led declaration against arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations to declare that this behavior the, of taking someone's citizen for, citizens for political leverage is wrong. Um, in my view, multilateral responses are the way that is going to change behavior. Imagine multiple countries coming together, UK, Canada, South Africa, Brazil, you name it, come together collectively and respond in the same way, putting visa restrictions, putting travel restrictions on countries, um, whatever the, the tool might be. That will be impactful. Or imagine there's multilateral tribunals where um, are, they're specifically punishing people who are behaving like this, taking other citizens. Imagine if there's international laws and norms that people must follow or there's real consequences if they don't. A lot of work is being done in this space. I will end with Civil societies, our civil society is critical 
to this work. Partnerships are key. Um, I believe that the US government does better than most countries working with civil society, and I definitely believe that in the, citizen, uh, in the hostage and wrongful detention space, the public part, public private partnership is very strong. So I'm very excited about tonight's meeting. I hope it's a catalyst for all the civil society groups out there to come together to be a real force and partner with the US government. Thanks. Well, thank you, Beth, for, for that. Um, I, yes, we could have a two hour conversation just on the complexities of how we get to a point in which we deter people uh, effectively on this. So I, I hope we'll have some questions on that. I do have my tablet here because we do have a QR code up on screen for those in the room. If you take a picture of that, your phone or device will take you to a Slido uh, where you can enter questions. So if you have a question, you can send it here. If you feel more comfortable emailing, Heroes, uh, Heroes Among Us at WACNH. I'm also checking there. Um, that's how we're going to be taking questions for the, the panel tonight uh, from both in person and online audiences. Um, so please do send in those, those uh, great questions that you'll have. Uh, I want to turn over to, to Diane Foley, the, uh, the mother of freelance journalist uh, James Foley, who was uh, publicly beheaded by, by ISIS in 2014. I don't think this is a conversation you ever uh, thought that you would be a part of back before this, this incident, uh, this tragic uh, part of your life, uh, being a, a nurse practitioner for 18 years. Um, so uh, you've, you've done a lot in this space in, in about a decade, um, helping to set up many of the uh, organizations and, and State Department laws and, and things of that nature to, uh, to work in this space. So we'd love to get your, your initial thoughts on this. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Beth, for that great overview. Of, we've really come a long way since Jim was taken. Jim was what our government considers a hostage because a terrorist group took him. And um, there was no one in our government to help me. There was none of this. None of it. So this, all this wonderful work that has been done in the last 10 years is an incredible, really in many ways was a response to the, the beheading of two, three Americans, three British citizens, and a young woman who was murdered. So we really had nothing in 2012 and 2014. And, but everyone told me um, they were on it, and Jim was their highest priority, and I was ignorant about the, our policy and the fact that as a nation we did not negotiate with terrorists. Um, and what was interesting about the, um, the jihadists took, targeted any Western journalist or aid worker they could find. So um, it was really a hodgepodge of citizens and it was interesting because many of them were, uh, they were all our allies. I mean there were, um, three from Spain, four from France, uh, three from Great Britain. Um, there was an Italian, a Danish. Um, uh, there were uh, several Belgian nurses. There were, it was just a real hodgepodge of Westerners, if you will. But when it came time to negotiating with the terrorists, instead of working together, which as Beth said, I so agree that collectively we must do, Instead, every nation chose to do it on their own. And all the European nations chose to negotiate with the terrorists. They found a way to um, get their loved ones out. So all the European hostages came home and are free today. But um, the uh, Americans and the great um, folks from Great Britain chose not to negotiate. So all of our citizens were killed. But I just, when that happened, I was angry. I just had felt like I'd been betrayed. You know, I felt like my government had told me um, they were on it. And I uh, very naively trusted and um, to be honest, poor folks in Washington, they didn't know what to do with me. They really didn't. They didn't. 
because there was no one accountable, there was no special envoy, there was no fusion cell, there was no one whose job it was to help me. So they sent me in circles, um, literally. They sent me the FBI, FBI would send me the State Department, everyone would send me to different places. And uh, anyway, but so when Jim was killed, I, I was angry. And I felt kind of betrayed by our government, to be honest. And I felt like, oh, you know, as Americans, we can do better than this. And so it was really that challenge from Jim. I really got in the Holy Spirit. I just felt like I didn't want to be bitter. I knew Jim would have wanted something good to come out of his, his torture. He was tortured and starved for two years before he was killed. So I know Jim would have wanted something better. So thanks to, you know, good people in the world, it was really after this happened, it's like all the good people stepped up, literally. Good people in government, all the people who are kind of appalled at what had happened and how we've been treated, all stood up. Um, people sent us money from all over the world. Um, so we thought we got to do something with this money. So that's when we started the James Foley Legacy Foundation. And thanks to all good people, so many good people, one being my dear colleague Amy, who's with me, has been with me for many years, made a lot of things happen, um, and, and other good people um, in our community. Senator Shaheen was one of my big helpers, you know, encouragers, but even she really didn't know what to do with me. She didn't know how to help me because we had no policy. We had no one whose job it really was to help me. Um, so, but bit by bit, especially as the other Americans were killed, um, Obama, the Obama administration um, felt compelled to do something. It was obvious um, that we had to do something as a nation. And that's when he ordered an all of government review that included families like us who had had someone, a loved one, taken hostage. And they actually listened to us. It was done by an incredible um, General Sokolik, was a great man, is a great man. Um, and that, he um, suggested all these recommendations that, you know, as a nation, we should have an enterprise where we actually help families, which is great, that would be nice, you know. And, um, and we actually can really work on how can we get people home and all this. So it was really thanks to President Obama after that that he ordered, he had a presidential policy directive in June of 2015, less than a year after Jim was killed, when he set up the structure, the current structure we have. So kudos to all of everyone involved in that because since 2012 when Jim was taken more than 100 innocent U.S. nationals have come home which is extraordinary <coughs> I really don't know if any of those people would have come home um, so a lot of good things have happened and wonderful people working I worked with Beth for years you know within the special envoy office Ambassador Carstens the best so but People who take people are vicious. Those countries just want to hold us hostage. Terrorists who take us, who target U.S. nationals, who travel for business, journalism, aid work, education, are looking for people to target. And bringing people home is very difficult, as Beth was saying. It is very complicated because people who take our people want to hold us hostage. So they want to demand things that are very hard for our government to do. They want to do anything they can to interfere with our economy, with, with our travel for um, our citizens. So it's very complicated work. So I totally agree with Beth that Deterrence is the biggest thing. We must found, find ways to do what we can to stop the horror of targeting of people. 
However, the reality is people have been targeted forever, unfortunately. You know, this is something, you know, this is an evil um, thing that has happened in the world. And I think as Americans, we also need to be more shrewd as we go out into the world, not be as naive, know how to behave when we go to other countries, when we're, you know, to, you know, um, and, um, our foundation recently put out last couple years ago a, just a traveler safety guide. The State Department has guides. But when we travel internationally, we must be intentional about our safety, um, for sure. I think that's, that's a big part of it. So I would, we would invite any and all of you to um, be part of our community because that's so right. We need one another. We do. We need our government, but our government can't do it all. As people, we need to decide, is it important that our nation has the back of brave Americans when they go out in the world to do diplomacy or journalism or education or whatever? And 10 years ago, we did not have anything. Now we do. It's still tough, though. Um, we have currently 49 public cases of U.S. nationals who've been designated as wrongfully detained. But there's many others. We are constantly getting calls from families who are in this gray zone. So of, you know, because a lot of times someone will take an individual and give alleged charges, as Celia can talk about, that will build up all this case against an innocent person. So sometimes it's really hard to discern did this person, did our American create a, do a crime or not? Or is the government just saying all these bad things against an individual that are totally untrue? But it can be complicated to do. So we still have our challenges. So we gratefully um, thank you for your support, your interest, because as a nation, we need you to do better. So thank you. And um, Amy's here with um, my book, American Mother, which if anyone's interested in reading about what happened to us um, and how our government has done good things and is but the challenges that remain, that's what that story is about. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Diane, for, for sharing those insights um, and, and your family's experience, um, which I'm sure does not get easier with, with time. Um, so I'd like to, to turn over to, to Zoya Fakori, um, a, uh, one of four daughters of Amir Fakori, who was, who was taken in 2017, I believe? 2019. 2019. Um, by the, the Lebanese government. Um, I'll let you tell the story because I'm sure you can do it much better than I can. Uh, but yeah, just uh, your your experiences and, yeah. and how you uh, come at this would be great. Thank you, Tim. Um, so I am, my name is Zoe Fakori. I'm the co-founder of the Amir Foundation. And just to dive into my story a little deeper, uh, my family went on a vacation to Lebanon to visit relatives in September 2019. When we arrived at the airport in Lebanon, my father's passport was confiscated. And just a tip for anyone who plans to travel, whenever a foreign government takes your passport, immediately go to the US Embassy. Um, but like Beth was saying, a lot of this information is not available to the public. You know, I wasn't looking at what the State Department's travel tips are at that time. So yeah, my father's passport was confiscated and they, they brushed it off as if this was a normal thing. And so this is a routine background check. Just come back a week later to pick it up. Everything's good. And we went on our day. We went to visit relatives. And the first week, it was a pretty decent vacation. My father went to the Lebanese General Security um, at his appointment that he had in the morning to pick up his passport. He never returned home. Um, after several hours, we started getting worried. That's when we went to the US Embassy. We explained our story to them. And they told us they're going to work on it. We received a call from the US Embassy later that night telling us they were unable to locate my father. So during this time, my father was being severely tortured at the Lebanese General Security. He was being forced to sign fabricated documents, which were then used to illegally detain him for seven months. So at this time when we found out he was abducted, basically, 
we immediately got Senator Shaheen involved on the case. And we are very grateful for her because she worked very hard to get my father back home. And we appreciate all the effort she did. Um, but for those seven months, they were extremely hard for us because we weren't aware of how to go about this situation. Um, we weren't, there wasn't guidelines at the time, actually. I know now there's more information for families on how to go about this. But at the time, there wasn't guidelines. And going on social media, now if you go to Twitter, I know it's called X, I still call it Twitter, but <laughs> if you go on there, you see there's a community for hostages. Um, there's advocacy groups, the Bring Them Home campaign, Hostage Aid Worldwide. There's people that you can reach out to. But at the time, there was none of that. So we weren't sure how to go about it. And we did the best we could. Um, but for the first um, few months, we were in the dark. Uh, we didn't have much transparency from the state department, to be honest with you. I know Spiha now does a great job at being in touch with families and having one-on-one -on -one meetings on the updates of their case. But at the time, we didn't have any of that. So we were in the dark. And one of the biggest struggles we had was how much influence foreign propaganda has on our media here in the States. So there was an article that was released in Lebanon by a Hezbollah-backed newspaper. And this article was filled with lies about my father. This article was translated word for word and released here in the States. So the first few months of my father's illegal detention, we were fighting to get the truth out, fighting to prove to the government, fighting to prove to the public my father is not who they say he is. And after we've gathered all that evidence, which wasn't easy to do, because when you're going through such high emotion, the last thing you want to do is gather evidence to prove that your loved one is, in fact, innocent. And these are all trumped up charges they had on him. But once we finally did that, they transferred my father's case to, to, um, to Spiha, and they classified him as a hostage. Um, but it took a lot of work to get there. And that's something I want to talk about, because they made my father this controversial figure when, in fact, he was an innocent man that went on a family vacation to see his relatives who he hadn't seen in a long time. And we were fighting to get the truth out. Another struggle we faced was proving that he was dying in the prison cell. So my father, unfortunately, he passed away shortly after returning from Lebanon. Um, he spent seven months in the prison. He came back a dying man. He went to Lebanon 225 pounds, he returned 150 pounds, and he passed away. And that's why we opened up this foundation in his honor to shed light on what's going on in these countries. Um, but one struggle we faced is the doctor that they had assigned to my father at the prison, he would tell the US Embassy that my father is healthy, he's fine, he's just a little stressed, we're giving him the proper medication, we're giving him Advil if he has a headache, but overall he's fine. It wasn't until our lawyer, Chris Reed, who's actually in the audience here tonight with us, and I really want to thank him for all the efforts he did in our case. Um, it wasn't until they finally gave him permission to see my dad, and he saw my dad very skinny. His skin was all grayed out, and he saw him a dying man. And it wasn't until he told Senator Jean Shaheen and he told the US Embassy, we need to urgently get this man out, or he will die in Lebanon. Um, so that, those were two of the biggest obstacles we faced. Finally, when my father returned, um, like I said, the condition he was in, it wasn't good and he passed away. But my family is still fighting. We're fighting to get accountability for what happened. Because four years have passed and we still don't have accountability. And that's an issue. Uh, we do have policies in place. We have the Levinson Act, which I know, Diane oh, Foley, your team worked. Yeah, <laughs> it's OK. It. Um, you worked Go so heavily on that. But the Levinson Act, it explicitly states that the president is authorized to impose sanctions on individuals who are complicit or responsible for, um, for individuals who are unjustly held abroad. However, this hasn't been implemented. No one has been held accountable in our father's case. Instead, we've actually received threats from the Lebanese government telling us to be quiet, threatening our relatives in Lebanon. Um, and that's something that I think needs to change. We have rules, we have policies, and I think the more we talk about it, the more we have conversations like this, then they, these policies will actually be implemented. Great.
Okay, uh, I'll have one question for you guys before we bring uh, Paul and Katrina back up, and I'd love to get your, your insights on it uh, before we move into audience questions. Quick reminder, Slido, Heroes Among Us at WACNH. We've gotten some good questions in the, in the chat so far, um, so please do keep sending those in. Uh, but we've, we've talked a lot about knowledge and awareness, and you know, I travel abroad, I'm generally aware of places that I probably shouldn't be going, um, but a lot of people aren't aware, and they aren't aware. Or I wouldn't know where to look if one of my family members or myself was was taken um, by a, by a terrorist group, by a, a, a government. Um, so, what can we do uh, beyond forums like this uh, to get the word out? And what can the people here in the room or watching online do? to help spread the word about uh, how people can be that more aware traveler uh, on the, in these places that people want to go to, people want to experience those cultures, but need to be aware of those challenges. Well, as Beth said, um, the State Department's worked quite hard on adding this STEP program. You can explain it better probably, Beth, but I think it's an important resource. Yeah, the uh, State Department has a program where you can register with the embassy, so if you're going anywhere, you can consider doing that. Um, certainly if you're going to risky countries, you should. There's a lot of um, things that can be done. I think the airline industries, I think the um, travel industry really needs to step up and amplify these kind of things. Travel magazines, like I said, social media needs to be talking about this. There are, um, you know, if you Google wrongful detention, if, if things aren't looking good, if you can't find your family member, first of all, first thing you do, go to the U.S. Embassy and let them know, or the U.S. Consulate. Um, they will put things in motion to start searching and to start looking into this. Um, it's important to note that there are thousands of arrests, legitimate arrests of Americans, um, over, I think every year around the world. Um, this is a small subset of cases we're talking about in the wrongful detention world. And the Levinson Act, which we haven't talked about a lot, it's critical to what really defines a case. And thankfully to Diane and the Levinson family um, for getting this act passed so that the US government can now really look at a case of an arrest and determine whether it's in fact wrongful or whether, in fact, it's not. Um, so that's really helped us identify cases so we can move quicker, um, we can put things in motion, and, and really start working on these cases. No, I agree with, with all of that. I think um, also, you know, you're just learning about it yourself, reading, you know, um, I would invite you to read my story, but I know others, um, more and more hostages returning now are putting out books. There's more um, testimony, witness, like Paul just witnessed what his experience was. I think some of it is just plain awareness, educating yourself. And certainly, you know, we can always use support. We do a freedom run annually, front, a run walk. We do uh, freedom awards in Washington where we bring families together with journalists and government people, all to try to raise awareness. But we need you, to be honest, um, to stay educated about it. You know, you can, um, I know the Amer Fakori Foundation does a newsletter. We, we also just restarted our newsletter. So there's lots of ways that you can get information. And, and the media has been one of our partners, too. The media has been trying to point up certain cases. I'm sure you've heard of Evan Gerkowitz, who's um, being held in Russia, Alsu Kramasheva who's um, being held there too. So uh, the media is starting to get more of these stories out there. And um, so we would invite you to participate in any of those ways. Do you have something? Any, anything you'd like to add? Um, uh, just to add on to what Diane said, just further education, further discussions like this. We do release a newsletter um, on our foundation page that gives insight on what's going on in the Middle East and what's going on with hostage cases. So. 
Great. Well, of course, uh, as an organization dedicated to helping people better understand the world, I, I love the, the work that you are all doing. Uh, and as we invite uh, Katrina and Paul back onto stage, please join me in thanking the, uh, the panel here for their, their insights. Drawing the, uh, the chairs here. <laughs> we'll survive. All right, actually, well, I'm going to try to do this, and I will get out of your way because I've been drinking there. Okay, um, so I want to bring in some audience questions here, um, and I'm going to try and combine a couple uh, because there, there are some themes that we're seeing come in, and just give you guys the opportunity to, uh, to respond however you may like. Um, so there's a lot of questions in the, in the chat about uh, accountability. Uh, so accountability for the Kami uh, regime, accountability in uh, the Fukuri case for, uh, for Lebanon. What, what ways in which, what ways are countries or organizations uh, held accountable? Is this something that needs to be strengthened? And what, how can we work to, to make this a, a more powerful deterrent, as we talked about earlier uh, in this conversation? It's huge, isn't it? I mean, it's one of the big, it, we have to hold people accountable. And most often, they're not held accountable. It's very difficult to. Uh, I, I'll just say um, we did, two of the jihadists who kidnapped and tortured Jim um, were, um, convicted two years ago in a Virginia um, courtroom, and they're getting life sentences. So that was miraculous, and that was due to incredible work from the FBI Department of Justice who stuck with it, and you know other Kurdish fighters who actually found them. And so it can happen, but it takes a long time and a lot of persistence. And I would say that uh, accountability ties into deterrence, Definitely. absolutely. So if a country knows that they're gonna be sanctioned, um, if a person who's assisting with the detention knows that they may be uh, punished in some manner, um, if somebody takes somebody hostage, they know that there's a crime against that, that they could be held accountable and prosecuted in the United States. So accountability is critical and um, we are just beginning, at least in the wrongful detention space, to go there. Yeah, I do want to add on that when you don't hold people accountable, like Beth said, um, this situation is going to keep happening. Um, if in our father's case, Lebanon, for example, it's a country that receives billions of dollars from America. Lebanon needs America in a way, you know, more than we need them. And so this is a country that you can easily start to hold individuals accountable. Instead, many of the officials involved with our father's case, they have visas to come to the States, their children study here in the States, and that's an issue because what the message that we're sending is you did this to an innocent individual, but right now his story is being shoved under the rug, to be honest with you, because there is no attention on it, and we're not, we haven't held anyone accountable. It's been four years, and yes, Diane, you, um, thank God you have held two individuals accountable, but after what? after 10 years of fighting, that shouldn't be necessary. Our government should help us in getting people accountable because the only thing these countries are getting is a win. They're getting whatever they're holding leverage against America. And they're winning at the end of the day because no one is being held accountable. It's become a business deal to them. And that's why we're seeing an uptake in um, illegal detention cases. I, I would just say also that in a case like Paul's, where it's the head of government mm -hmm. that is manipulating and, and orchestrating a kidnapping and torture and a sham trial, uh, we must, we must also rely on the media to expose the truth. Because governments, mm -hmm. all governments, including our own, have many, many agendas mm -hmm. operating at the same time. And, I hate to say it, but Paul Kagame, who 
as Paul said, you know, has written the history, um, has been described as the darling dictator of the West. He's a dictator, but he's very beloved by a lot of democratic governments. And the media has not done its job in ripping off the mask. I'll defer to Paul, but I think journalists and, and those telling the story can play a big role, especially when it is um, a, a government that is basically committing the crime. But I think the, the world also had kind of closed eyes and ears does not want to see, does not want to hear. If you see what was, has been going on in Rwanda, it was on April 6, 1994, at 8.30 p.m., when today's Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, and his people, his team, shut down the then Rwandan president plane. The world knows who this is. This was the event that triggered the genocide. That is how the genocide broke out immediately at that hour. That man is kind of respected by the international community they know that on October 18th, 1996, two years later, that man invaded the Congo. Why? There was no good reason. Just to steal minerals. And this whole world, once again, closed eyes and ears. Didn't want to see, didn't want to hear. He has been killing people. Congolese, more than 10 million Congolese have been killed. As we are talking now, Congolese are being butchered by the Rwandan president. Congo has never, ever attacked Rwanda one day. But Rwanda has been fighting in the Congo for the last 28 years. Rwanda is selling more minerals than the Congo. Rwanda has got no minerals. We don't have anything. And we know that. The whole world knows. Rwanda is selling minerals for billions of dollars. The Congo selling nothing, invaded. Its population being butchered. So this world, does it see? It just looks. The world looks, but doesn't see. The world maybe listen, pretend to listen, but never but pretend not to understand what the criminals are doing all over the world. Today, Rwanda, neighboring countries of Rwanda, Rwanda has got four countries which stay at the same border. Burundians are fighting Rwandans in the Congo to try to kick, to kick out the Rwandan army. The Tanzanians are also helping the Congo to fight and get out Rwanda from the Congo. So where is the world? That world that closed eyes and ears in 1994, when innocent civilians were being butchered for the last 30 years, it turned 30 about four days ago. Rwanda is celebrating celebrating one part of the population. Clinton was there. He was invited. A US delegation went to help Rwanda to celebrate. How do you help a thief to steal? How do you help, how do you celebrate with a criminal, knowing that a criminal is a criminal? Can I yeah, just say it. one thing to follow up on what Katrina said? Media absolutely is a partner in this hostage enterprise. They can shame these countries. They can bring awareness to the public about travel risks. They can keep 
in the public eye cases. Think about the Evan Gershkovitz case, how the Wall Street Journal every single day has an article about that. His one year anniversary in Russia was just a few weeks ago. And the campaign, the, the series of um, articles and, and live shots of, uh, by reporters to show his case and so that no one will forget. Brittany Griner, the imme incredible media attention in her case, was in the public eye constantly. It's really important for the media to step up on these cases. And one thing I will also add for media, it's really difficult for the president to make some of these decisions. Politically, these are hard decisions that the president makes when we get our people home. The media can really play a part in telling the public why it's important for the traveling public, for the business community working overseas, for the world community, why it's important for uh, the president to be making these tough decisions. So we have a, a, a great follow-up question from the audience on that. Um, and, and basically the point is that, yes, they agree before and after it can be very helpful, but we see in the Evan Gershwitz case the, the Putin regime saying, this needs to be done in private, this needs to be done in silence. Um, so what has your experiences been and what, has your, what are your feelings around uh, bringing light to these, these cases um, when perhaps regimes around the world don't want to be associated with having uh, illegally detained people. Um, so how do, we, how do we balance between telling the stories, getting the word out there, but also negotiating in, in the good faith that, that needs to be done in order to resolve these cases? I would, Go ahead, oh, yeah, I would like to just touch a little bit about that, just because Lebanon is one of those countries that doesn't want to have a bad reputation. Like I said, it gets a lot of money from America. So having that reputation that, oh, it illegally detained an American, it's not a good look. So that's why they tried to make my dad out to be this villain. And finally, we got the media here in America to see the truth. Um, we had a few good reporters that touched, that talked a lot about our case. And that's what brought my dad home. Because if we didn't go to the media, if we didn't talk as much as we did, they told us to stay silent. I remember three months said, we're like, no, we have to say something. They're like, no, like, it will go quicker if you don't. We just didn't listen. And thank God we didn't, because like I said, my dad was dying in prison. And because we went on the media, Trump was president at the time, we went on Fox and Friends and pled my father's case to get him back home. And luckily, they tell us that Trump was watching when we went on. And that's why things moved along, along so quickly after that. But going to the media is important, because like I said, these countries do not want to have a bad reputation. But we shouldn't give them what they want. At the end of the day, they're unjustly detaining an innocent individual. They're already winning by they're getting something back. In a lot of these cases, these countries do get what they want. They're using these individuals as political pawns. And so we shouldn't give them that, have keeping them with a good reputation that they would like. I think you're making a great point. I, however, I find with families, uh, it can be difficult. Like in our case, I felt the same way as Zoya. Um, our FBI told us, don't tell anybody that Jim's been taken, all that. And um, I felt, oh, we needed the help of the journalist community. Jim was a journalist. We needed help because FBI had no idea where he was. We had no boots on the ground in um, Syria at the time, so we needed help. He disappeared. Um, and we didn't even know who had taken him. So we went to the media. We also. Um, uh, did all we could to get any media. Um, but I think in our case, and it does in some cases, can make the case more valuable. And I think it made Jim more valuable to ISIS. And, and I think there are some cases that it is better with certain circumstances, and that's what's always hard with a family. Because we never can tell a family what to do. You know, a family's got to go with what they think is right. Um, because there are, and in our case, I think we made um, Jim more too valuable. So it isn't <laughs> one um, thing doesn't fit all. I do think media attention certainly can help the give the president know that the people think that we do have a moral duty to have the backs of our people. That as a 
group of, as our nation, we do have a, a moral reason to help those in that situation, but at the same time, we've got to work on deterrence, which is sometimes in um, opposition to each other. So it's, it's complicated. <laughs> it is excruciatingly complicated, and I do think that in a way, there's sort of these um, countervailing forces. On the one hand, you have to bring maximum pressure. And most of the time, that is going to involve raising the public profile of the wrongfully detained individual. But there also needs to be a way of keeping an off-ramp available yes. for the offending yes. government or the, I think that's more effective with offending mm -hmm. governments than out and out terror, murderous gangs and groups, but there needs to be an off-ramp so that they can have some sort of a face-saving way to bring a very difficult situation mm -hmm. to conclusion. And it is extraordinarily complicated, and as you say, Diane, there is no one-size-fits-all, but um, Erwin Kotler, uh, very greatly admired international lawyer who has represented people like Natan Sharansky and Nelson Mandela, um, you know, very high profile people like Paul who were wrongfully detained. And he has said you need to somehow make the cost of keeping that hostage, that wrongfully detained person, higher, greater to the government than the benefit they're getting out of silencing Paul, out of imprisoning him and torturing him. At some point, mm -hmm. you have to have that government saying, this is costing us more, whether in prestige, whether in foreign aid, whether in you know our reputation, then we are getting out of it. And so you have to somehow change that balance. I think that this is also what I told my family before a long time before I went to prison. I told them that if you happen to see somebody in such a situation, you've got to raise the voice and talk for that person, be it through the media or by all means you can. Talk, because that is the only way to save those people in trouble. As much as you talk about this, you are kind of raising awareness, telling the world what should be done. And this is what my family did when I was in prison. They never happened to shut up. <laughs> as Diana was saying, as Diana was saying, even the, what I, the leaders, the intelligence guys, would tell you, ah, you shut up. We are going to, we are handling that. Do never, do never accept to shut up. S speak up. Talk about those people in danger. The more you talk about them, the more you'll be attracting the international community's attention. You'll be telling the world and also showing the problem and shaming the ones who kidnap or who torture your own people. Okay, uh, I know we have blown past our, our stated time, but I wanna, I wanna fit in one final question because I do think it's important and something that we wanted to talk about, we've kind of touched on. Um, but there have been a couple of questions about uh, sort of the real policy of our government about negotiating for hostages and uh, the, the perverse uh, incentives that can be put out there if we are negotiating, um, which I think is why uh, Diane's family experienced what they experienced, uh, uh, trying not to uh, encourage other entities, organizations, governments to, to legally detain people. So uh, just lightning round as, as quick as we can. Um, what, what do we think about sort of the balance point there on negotiating, giving into some of these demands while trying to uh, maximize deterrence? I think we must find ways to to talk to captors. And if you don't work 
somehow with the person, the um, entity holding the person, there's no hold. But the problem is, I think a lot of it has to be done privately. I think there need to be many channel, channels um, that are developed. Um, I think a lot of times out of people out of government can do it, like foundations or uh, people who know somebody in a country and put the dots together. Or, uh, you know, we've had people who've gotten out because they knew someone who knew the person in charge of the prison and talked to the right people. I mean, there's many, but they need to be channeled. There needs to be some way to interface with the, with the people holding the people hostage. So to just plain say we will not engage, that's what you would say. You know, we have to have some way. But it's tough because we're talking about brutal people, you know, as Paul can witness and, and Zoya. I mean, we're talking about people who don't consider the life of a person worth anything. So that's the hard part. But we have to find some way, in my opinion, to have some channels. Diane is absolutely right. You must be able to speak with these people, negotiate with them. Otherwise, there will be no hope. Um, so that's very important. I just forgot my train of thought here. But go down the row, sure. and it will yeah. come back to me. All right. Um, I think, it, like Diane mentioned earlier, it's a case-by-case -case basis. In Diane's case, it might have been better to go through, um, to, do, to negotiate with the terrorists. I think in our case, in countries like Rwanda and countries like Lebanon, when they're unjustly detaining an individual, these countries, they take a lot from America. And I reiterate this point just because it's important. Um, when you have these countries taking a lot from America, we should hold that, you know, we should hold that against them in a way and say, okay, if you don't return this individual, we have to set a message to other exactly. countries. When you don't set a message, this will continue happening. It will continue happening from more countries of, hey, like, look at what this guy got from America. Let's detain this individual. It's going to keep on happening. So I do think we should. But to me, that is a form of negotiating. Yeah. Let's say, fine. You know, you want aid? Well, we need our person back. I remember you know? now what I was going to say. <laughs> if I write it, I remember it. Um, there really has not, there's not a lot of data that shows that there, this is an incentive. Um, so I think a lot more research needs to be done in this area to, to show cause and effect, to show whether these takings, whether these negotiations, whether the results, what it takes to get people back, actually um, gives rise to further. Uh, as far as we know, as working for the government, um, it, the data doesn't support that. It doesn't, and it mm -hmm. seems like it would. Like, and that was the whole reason why President Obama chose not to negotiate, because we had this slogan that if we negotiate, well, they're going to take more people. But the reality is Americans, US nationals are targeted all the time. And that's a reality. So we have no research at this point that actually shows that. Well, and I think but, it would, of course, depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. In, in Jim's case, he was much more valuable to be executed publicly to, to ISIS and their ideals and what they wanted to tell around the world than necessarily getting anything specific out of the US that the US would have been willing Willing they to get. Try to negotiate sure. First yeah. Him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Katrina. Well, I, I think um, the U.S. government still looms large in the world, both because of our financial might and our military might and our diplomatic might. And I think we are far too reluctant to use our leverage mm -hmm. with countries with whom we have leverage. I think that's so true. And I think um, that's on us, mm -hmm. and we need to do better. And a small country like Rwanda that is overwhelmingly dependent on international aid, I continue to believe that if the President of the United States had picked up the phone and said, I want the hero of Hotel Rwanda released immediately, or we are going to cut off every penny of aid going to your small country, and we are going to put maximum pressure on every other country 
that gives you aid. Paul would not have languished for nearly three years in prison. So we mm -hmm. are not bold enough. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I know our State Department wants to maintain good relations with countries, mm -hmm. but where we have leverage, we should use it more forcefully. But I agree, Katrina, totally. And I think we have to have the moral courage to do that. Like, we have to say this is valuable to us. Our people are important. Exactly. You know. But the second thing, which Diane and, and um, Zoya and Beth referred to, and that's on each of us, is not to be overly confident and not to be arrogant because you happen to hold that American passport that when you travel abroad, you are safe, that you can afford to go to risky countries and it will all be all right. You know, we here in New Hampshire, we have the beautiful White Mountains, and I listen on the radio when they say, you know, hiking conditions are treacherous, but you always have that group of people that insist on going hiking, and then vast sums of money and other people's lives are put at risk to rescue those who set off unprepared with a somewhat cavalier attitude. Well, it's even more so the case if you go to these dangerous, risky places, knowing that you might, in fact, run afoul because you are valuable with that American passport, whether it's criminals, whether it's terrorists, or sometimes governments. Um, you know, I have said many times to my husband, I'm very outspoken, for example, about Russia. I said, you could not pay me enough to go to Russia now because I'm not important enough. I'm irritating enough but I'm not terribly important. And if they decided, you know, that little human rights activist from little old New Hampshire, she's an irritant. Let's just, you know, plant something in her briefcase, in her suitcase, and throw her in jail. I'm not Brittany Griner. So you have to be mindful, you have to be aware, and you have to take some responsibility for your own security if you're going to travel with countries where the rule of law does not exist. And there are a lot of interesting places in the world that are not rule of law countries, and you need to be aware of that. Katrina, you are absolutely right. I agree with you completely. It is tough, it's difficult. There are plenty of people who are humanitarian workers, reporters, faith-based groups that are going to these risky countries um, because they do important work in those places. And so, as much as we can tell them, don't go, there's travel warnings, there's risks, you could be detained, they're gonna go. And so their companies, their employers really need to step up, they need to give training, they need to do risk assessments, they need to be holding the proper insurance, they need to be doing a lot of things when they're sending their employees over to these countries. I think the corporations, which I said is at the beginning is a partner in all of this, really need to be thinking about those kind of things. They also need to be thinking about whether they should be doing business in these countries. Um, looking, the US government could be looking at disincentives for these countries, uh, these companies to go into these places. We could be putting travel restrictions on somebody's US passport, like we do with North Korea. We could be putting financial restrictions for people to, tr to go spend money in, like Cuba in these countries. So these things, what would be palatable with the traveling public? What's gonna be palatable for Congress? What's gonna be palatable for the, the corporate world? Needs to be balanced against prevention. And it's tough. As you are putting it, sometimes also the superpowers can put a little bit of pressure so those countries which depend on foreign aid from those superpowers, and those that, that pressure also work. I remember it was on uh, December 15, 2022, when the Rwandan president, Paul Kagame, came to Washington, D.C. He talked to a newspaper, Semaphore, which is not even one of the most known papers in this country. And he told them that whoever wants to see me free,
from the prison, from that the kind of the solitary confinement, has got to attack Rwanda, fight against him, win. At the very time they win, then they will come to prison and get me out. That was December 15, 2022. Three months later, it was, it was on uh, March 14th. He went to Qatar. And he said, he called the same people and told them that, I want to talk to you. What do you want to say? I want to tell you that that man can also be free. We can set him free. We even we forgive genocidaires, why not him? Was it because of his pity? No. He had been shouting, saying that pressure here, pressure cannot work, pressure cannot work. I was sentenced to 25 years in prison, qualified as a, a hostage. And he knew that. He had said three months before, he had said that you will never set me free. I've got to be in prison for 25 years. But three months later, because of pressure, he set me free. So these superpowers can also stand for what they believe in and just put a bit of pressure into it always work. It works. Why not? If it works for me, why can't it work? or anybody else. All right, well, I think that's a wonderful place to stop. Uh, I would love to continue the conversation for another two hours, but I don't know that our audience will uh, stand for that. Um, but thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, please join me in thanking them for their wonderful remarks and insights. And just a few closing remarks. Thank you to the Lantos Foundation, the Fukuri Foundation, the Foley Foundation, the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire, the Institute of Politics, and the Bank of America Foundation for uh, their support of this program. If you are interested in getting a signed copy of Diane's book, you can join her uh, and her team over here. Um, but thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you joining us here tonight. Uh, and please do share out the recording to all your friends, family, and network so that they can gain the same insights that you did here tonight. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.